<laughs> Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to start my uh, comedic career here up on the stage. Uh, but uh, my iPad is, uh, you know, a giant iPad, and it's uh, super heavy, so I, I have to uh, have it on the on the stand here. So um, I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Sean McBriarty. I'm an educational advocate, uh, educational freedom advocate, and I'll explain that in a minute. I really want to thank uh, Brandon. Uh, I'm going to call him Brandon Vito uh, Hayes because it's hard to keep up with all of the instant message, signal, text. Depends on what day is going on. But um, and then also, I want to thank any veterans in the crowd. Uh, I'm really sorry that my generation, Generation X, has kind of lost this country, and we're going to speak to that a little bit as well. But, you know, the veterans honored our flag by standing by it, and now you're seeing the dumbest generation of students come out of our public schools. So I'm going to speak to that a little bit too. And I want to lead off with a quote from Ronald Reagan that I'm sure you've heard before, but it's so much more applicable today. Freedom was never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day, we will spend our sunset years telling our children that our children's children what it was like once in the United States where men were free. Does anybody know what year that speech was given? 1967. 1967, when he just started his political career. And it's, and it's more true today than it ever has been. So uh, it was probably about March, maybe of this year, Brandon and I started chatting a little bit, uh, kind of uh, what I was doing, uh, some of the things that I was you know, trying to expose here in, in Maine, where I'm from. And uh, I probably just pressured him so much by all the content that I provide every day that he finally caved and said, hey, can you come on down and speak to the group here? So I, I appreciate it. Um, and I'm probably going to duplicate some of the things that other folks are going to say today, but these are the right things to be speaking about. And what I'll do is uh, I'll try to roll through some information. Uh, if you guys are captive audience, you know, I literally could talk all night, but I'm not going to. But uh, I'd love for somebody to ask some questions at the end of the presentation, and uh, maybe we can kind of do a little Q&A there. So uh, on the internet, I know Brandon put activist under my headshot, but I'm an advocate. I speak for parents, I speak for students, for teachers, for taxpayers that feel they don't have a voice yet because of cancel culture. And uh, you know, I, I, I see an activist as somebody standing on the corner with a megaphone screaming, but without a real plan to fix it. So um, I'm not saying I wouldn't do that, but generally that's not my style. So I'm also a journalist. Uh, I host a podcast called Main Source of Truth. You can download it anywhere you listen to podcasts. And I'm also a free speech advocate, and I'll speak to that. I was effectively labeled America's most dangerous dad by a friend of mine, Sharona Bishop, who's America's mom on Frank's speech. And that just kind of stuck. So what do I do day to day? What is my superpower? My superpower is to upset the far left, the socialists, the American communists, and drive them batshit crazy, to be honest with you. So um, often when I enter a room, I don't even have to say a word. They just know they're gonna have a bad night because I'm there and I already have done my homework and they're gonna get lit up. So, um, and I use, I use ridicule to do that. I, I know that's not always popular, um, but ridicule is one of those, uh, I think it's number five, rules for radical Sal Alinsky. Um, it's very difficult to combat ridicule, and the left uses it on conservatives all the time. And generally speaking, I never throw the first punch, uh, but it's like, you know, hey, how do you defeat a bully on the playground? You punch him back in the nose. So, you know, uh, figuratively instead of literally. But, and then when they start calling me names, which they do a lot, I, I actually kept a spreadsheet for a while uh, because I'm just anal retentive. But when they start doing that, I know I've won because they cannot defend their position. So I want to say right out of the gate, I'm not a very smart guy. I am just very diligent and determined. Uh, and that's what has kept me alive for these 53 years. I really wasn't sure what I was going to write down coming to this meeting, but I did some homework. So, you know, what's the Natural Law Institute Convention all about? Uh, families, right? So Restoring the family and its stability as a focus of all policy and the family as first institution all others are built upon as the smallest unit of liberty, freedom, and political action. So everything that I'm going to talk about and everything I've ever talked about is all about division. It is a Marxist agenda to destroy the country. And that flies over the head of many people because I can't even get people to pause when I say there's porn in their local school library. But this is what it is. It's the intent to divide the child from the family unit to destroy the school, divide the community, divide the state, and obviously our country is in a massive schism right now. 
And again, the school, in my opinion, schools are worth saving, but they are irreparably broken. Anybody that has a child in a public school system right now, this is gonna come off kind of mean, you're a bad parent because you don't know what's going on behind those brick walls. And it is horrific. What I have seen is the top 10% of the iceberg that is above the waterline. The other 90% I haven't even got to yet. It's that bad. So uh, another piece here, education, restoring education to the production of competency and responsibility while updating to take advantage of future technology. Um, again, the government can't run anything, yet they're trying to run your local schools and you think that that's gonna produce a good student. It's not, we'll speak to some of those here in a minute. Uh, economy, restoring the economy, financial sector, consumer credit, educational costs and taxation for the benefit of the intergenerational family is one of the things that uh, was on your website. The educational tax costs today are insane. In my prior town, I lived in, in Cumberland, Maine, just north of Portland, Maine. My property, uh, my property tax rate to the school was 70%. The next town over North Yarmouth, it was 85%. If you don't know how much of your property taxes are going to your local school, I would urge you to pull out your tax bill figure out the percentage, and then do the math over the last decade, and you will be scared to death at what you've sent to indoctrinate your kids or your neighbor's kids. The return on investment in education has never been worse in our country's history. While young students in China are learning how to build rockets, our kids know what their personal pronoun is. They can't spell blue or tie their shoes, but they know they're non-binary, or they know because of their skin color they're either an oppressor or oppressed. That's what's going on in Maine schools and schools across the country at age five, starting in kindergarten, because I've proven it. I have all the receipts, I don't make anything up, so. But in Maine, the nation's report card data in 2022 showed the lowest assessments in the state's history, and I have to assume Massachusetts or any of the states you're from are probably very similar. Only one in four K through 12 students in Maine can do math at proficiency, only one in four. Uh, only one in three kids can read at proficiency. It's, it's the worst scores we've ever seen. So why do these schools need more money every single year when uh, the uh, student enrollment is down because luckily people are pulling their kids for homeschooling. Maine right now has 10% homeschooling. Next year I hope it's 12, the year after that I hope it's 13. Those are the right parents. And parents, you can do it in one or two hours a day and do 10 times the work that your local school is doing in seven hours a day. Kids should not be confined to the classroom like they are, and the concepts are just whacked at this point. So, uh, but nobody ever holds their local school board accountable for what's happening. Every year, everybody says, it's for the kids. Just, in, you know, just increase the amount, five or 10%. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll pay everybody more, even though the assessment data is worse. And, and nobody ever calls them on it. One of the things that's on your website, law, restoring our constitution, law, and courts, uh, ending the age of undermining, canceling, and reputation destruction, as well as restoring truthful speech in public to the public in matters that are public. I'm all about truthful speech. I currently have three active lawsuits pending against school districts in Maine, and I'm working hard to protect your First Amendment rights as well. So my first, which was decided last year, I won $40,000 from my hometown, Hamden, Maine, near Bangor, in McBriarty versus Miller, uh, in what should have provided students and parents and taxpayers and teachers the ability to go to the microphone and say whatever they want, as long as it's school related. And the only two things that the First Amendment doesn't protect you from are inciting violence and using real obscenities, the obscenities that George Carlin, the seven things you can't say on TV, like that stuff, right? So it was a win for the First Amendment, and I didn't keep a dime of the taxpayer money, I never will. But we've had to sell, sue this same school district again because they kicked me out of two more school, meeting, school board meetings after I won the lawsuit for the very same thing. So, uh, and for the record, I was getting kicked out of school board meetings before it was cool, okay? So just, just, to, be, just to be clear. <laughs> so uh, I, I've been uh, taking on this calling for three and a half years. The last two and a half years, I've done it unpaid. Uh, and that's my choice. I, I have a decent financial situation. I have a beautiful house. I have a, a loving family. And, and luckily, my, you know, my wife owns everything that I have. So uh, it's, it's good. But um, one of the things I say is, like, I'm one of the OG fathers in this space. There are not many fathers. There are not many men willing to stand up for their kids. And I kind of just kind of grew up thinking that's the only, the only reason I exist. 
you know, is to stand up and, and shield my kids from harm. I know a lot of mama bears across the country, but we need more strong fathers to take a stand. Uh, I have another school district suing me using taxpayer money. It's Herman School Department versus McBriarty. Uh, and they're trying to take away my First Amendment rights because I called a teacher a groomer and a sexual predator. And I can back all that stuff up. Um, this teacher was paid, the paid faculty advisor to the Gay Sexuality Alliance, a group funded by GLSEN, a national organization which is in 4,000 schools, I guarantee it's in your local school, in 40 states. Gay Sexuality Alliance, a taxpayer funded extracurricular after school activity which parents didn't know about. So you could send your kid to soccer band chorus or talk sexuality with a 40 year old teacher. That's how bad it is inside these schools. Lastly, there's McBriarty versus Herman School Department. I'm suing them back uh, for Freedom of Access Act violations. Uh, your right to know, I don't know what's called in Massachusetts, it could be FOIA, um, but that is your most powerful weapon against these government entities. And I would urge you, if you don't already know about FOIA or FOA, to, uh, to really dive into that. Uh, the last thing I think uh, was on the website was militia and uh, restoring the militia, public responsibility to one another for defense, policing, disaster, care, and recovery. Um, now, as far as I know, Maine's concealed carry license doesn't carry over in Massachusetts, so I have no further comment on the seven weapons on my person. <laughs> uh, so um, I'm looking to learn a lot from you folks this weekend. I really appreciate this. Um, the Natural Law Institute promise cognitive clarity a means of understanding ourselves, the world, and even the universe, and how it's prioritized, and your attention and confidence. So individually, as groups, we can reverse the decline. I kind of dumb this down for myself, and I call this exposure. Um, I think of this uh, situation that I've been in as a four-act play, and parents, um, this is an egotistical statement, but I've been seen on TV 10 million times across the globe, yet nine out of 10 parents in my own hometown have no idea what I'm talking about. Because the media in Maine is the fourth branch of government, and you will never see any of this stuff reported. So um, I also like to say that this section, in my mind, kind of refers to truth. And I talked to a guy Tuesday in the parking lot. I ran for uh, a write-in candidate for my local town council. I got murdered in the polls, just to let you know. But I gave it a shot, and I gave him my card, and he looked at it, and he said, Maine source of truth. And he kind of flipped it over, and he said, your version of the truth. And I said, dude, there's only one version of the truth. Like, we are now in a post-truth society where you think that unicorns exist. And if you don't affirm that unicorns exist, you're a homophobe. No, you have a brain, okay? Unicorns don't exist, they're not real. So, um, and the other thing here uh, you speak to is solutions. Uh, there isn't a problem, the human scale, that uh, we don't know how to solve. Uh, there is a principled conflict in existence uh, that we should be able to address and solve for. Um, and I call that the second act of the four part play where at least in Maine, I can't get them out of the exposure phase, right? So nine out of 10 people in my own hometown don't know what's going on. I can't get them to the solutions phase. If I do get them to the solutions phase and I've tried it myself, you are instantly bludgeoned for being a racist, transphobe, misogynist, whatever, some of those 40 on my spreadsheet. Um, none of those are true by the way. And, but nobody wants to solve for the root cause dynamic of the problem, the root cause. They want to just chatter about this stuff up here. So we're stuck in this exposure phase. Um, and for me, I just kind of use it as hate fuel. I, I, I'm kind of a sick person. I wouldn't recommend this. It's not healthy. <clears throat> but when they hate on me, I just, it charges my batteries. And I know I'm hitting the target dead nuts when the far left and the rhino right are both freaking out at the same time. And that's the reason I didn't get elected in my hometown because the rhinos were freaking out. They knew I was coming with some you know, pretty, pretty big uh, truth bombs and the far left obviously hates me. So anyway, um, and then lastly, I think a piece here about action. Once you know the solution, victory is just uh, the work to bring it about. And like I said, to me, that action phase is kind of the third phase of this play, getting involved in local elections. You have to take back your local elections. <clears throat> At least in Maine, the state is lost. The, the, the state is a lockdown blue state run by Democrats, Governor Mills, Democrat, House Senate ruled by Democrats, Attorney General's office, Democrat. So local control might be the only thing we have left to influence. And what I found out uh, Tuesday, and I wrote it in an article on my Substack at Sean McBriarty, is that um, I didn't have enough money or enough people or enough resources to out battle the far left. 
I just thought like my grandfather did when he was a senator in Maine, that I could go to every single house in the district, shake hands, look people in the eye, talk to them about the issues, and then they would vote for me. I got 81 votes as a write-in, which is pretty decent considering the previous write-ins only needed two or three dozen votes to get written in. But my opponent, a far left doctor, got 210 votes because I was up against a machine essentially. So, but I think I'm hoping that as people continue to see some of this, um, you know, degradation that will hopefully get some people more, more involved. And I know you folks are, so I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. Um, so a little bit of a history. So the world changed for me back in May of 2020. Um, it was the height of COVID. A restaurant in Maine called Sunday River Brewing Company decided to go against Janet Mills's mandate to keep the restaurants closed. And they decided to open for business one day. And it was like a Thursday night, if I remember right. So I was headed up to hunt turkeys with my dad. I kind of took a little bit of a circuitous route and just wanted to go. And I stood in line with 400 other patriots. And I looked around and uh, I have a, a black ram truck. Uh, I own guns. I hunt. I have a dog, you know, that. And that was like everybody that was there, women dressed in camouflage. And I'm like, this is freaking great. People who actually think the same as I do. And they were just there to support this restaurant. And the scallops I had that night were amazing. But I, I kind of, from there, I guess, had a little bit of a thought balloon to say, something's not right with what the government is doing to us today. And my eyes really opened very shortly after that. We're on June 2nd, 2020, as a parent of then junior twin girls in Greeley High School in Cumberland, Maine, which is allegedly the safest, most affluent, most educated community in the state of Maine with what they say is the best high school in the state, we received a letter from our superintendent calling us all white supremacists. On the heels of George Floyd's death, I won't call it a murder, on his death, while Minneapolis is literally burning to the ground, I'm working from the desk at my home, my wife is working at the table, I read this email and I turned to my wife Patty and I said, are you reading this shit? Like, where's this coming from? Now, my wife on a scale of zero to 10, uh, as far as contra controversy, controversy goes, she's like a negative seven. She hates all this stuff. She doesn't want to get involved. And that's one of the issues with a lot of parents is they're not willing to go and actually even investigate what's happening. And I'm her husband and I'm like looking at this information and he calls us white supremacists five times in this email. It wasn't like it was a mistake, like, hey, I slipped a couple letters here. And you know, it was white supremacist, a couple paragraphs down, white supremacy. And uh, talking about how, because I, I was white, you know, I'm reading it as, you know, and, and personalizing it, uh, that I must have some white privilege that I was never aware of as a child of the 70s and 80s growing up fairly poor, I would say poor middle class, the, uh, a child of three divorces, my parents divorced, they got remarried, divorced, you know, so three divorces, kind of kind of crazy, but everybody has a past, right? It doesn't matter what your skin color is, it doesn't matter what your sexuality is, your political preference, whatever. So. Um, I very quickly did what I thought anybody would do is I just shot this superintendent back a note and said, hey, by the way, did you ever think about the First Amendment and peaceful protests? And, you know, we live in the safest uh, town in the state. The police department's great. I know half of those guys. We shouldn't be co-parenting with the school. This isn't your lane. Stay out of the lane, right? This is my job as a dad to teach my kids about what's going on right now. And oh, by the way, even Portland, Maine had riots going on because we had our local BLM and Antifa goofballs over there. Very quickly, he came back with, you're not woke enough to understand what I'm talking about. Okay. So then I thought about like, did I miss something? Um, I used to manage supermarkets for Hannaford, uh, you know, 10,000 customers uh, a week, 150 employees, you know, millions of dollars of sales and revenue. Did, did I miss something in the last decade since I stopped doing that? Like, what happened? So I was kind of like, huh. I had to do a little introspection, right? But what I found was is that my local school illegally hired an equity committee in 2019, and they were just waiting for this thing to happen. That was the spark that lit the fire so they could call us all white supremacists and divide the community. And instantaneously, that's what happened. People other than me texted, emailed the superintendent and said, hey, look, what are you talking about? This, is, this doesn't happen. Like people are racist, but institutional racism hasn't existed since 1964. If it did, the courts would be log jammed all day long with court cases and they're not. So racism, yes. Institutional racism, no. Nobody in three and a half years has given me one example of institutional racism 
except for I use the Planned Parenthood abortion situation where 70% of abortion clinics are in predominantly black neighborhoods. To me, that's what's going on today. So equity is impossible. Don't allow people to use that in a word. Um, basically what's happened is they've dumbed down a lot of the situations in the school to try to create equity and we're all equal under God and allegedly under the law, but equity is garbage. So I kind of went through that introspection. I started doing some homework and what I found was that a company in Massachusetts called Community Change Inc. Uh, uh, and the director, uh, a woman's name, uh, Shea Stewart Belay, uh, you can actually follow her on Twitter. She's crazy. It's at black girl in Maine without the E at the end. Okay. So at black girl in Maine. So I very quickly pulled up her social media and instantaneously anti-father, anti-police, uh, inciting violence, sexual frustrations, very graphic. Like this is the director of a group of equity grifters that was stealing taxpayer money from me, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, this, this just shouldn't be going on. And then I found out in their June newsletter, it said, in order to eliminate racism, we must eliminate capitalism and move to a socialist and anarchist form of government. Okay, so let that kind of resonate a little bit. My school district is telling teachers to tell my kids that socialism and anarchism is no big deal, right? That's how asleep at the wheel I was for, at that point, 11 of their years in school. So um, their charge really was to brainwash weak males and suburban soccer moms, somehow making them believe that even though there's not a shred of proof anywhere, that they're inherently racist because they were born with what's called white privilege. Um, now, occasionally I go, I, I did this in Augusta, I affirm myself as a hundred pound black trans woman lesbian. Okay, and, 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 my, and my, my other name is Yolanda. You, you can see the video, I think it's on my YouTube, I don't remember. But I've, I've gone to Augusta, the state capitol, and I've said, hey look, uh, today I'm Yolanda, and you've got to affirm me as Yolanda, and if you don't, you're a misogynist, transphobe, whatever. That's how dumb this is, right? I don't care what you do in your home. I don't care what you do in your sexuality, your lifestyle, whatever. The moment you use my taxpayer money to affect my children or any of my friend's kids, it's over. Like that should be the easy like line of delineation, no more, okay? So she profited off these dumb soccer moms all over New England and uh, I just couldn't believe what was going on. But critical race theory, the easiest definition that I've found in three and a half years is they're pushing skin color over content of character. That's the easiest way to go about it. If skin color is being pushed over content, that's critical race theory. And it's a praxis because you're never gonna find a binder on a teacher's desk, like here's the critical race theory binder. It's a praxis, it's a practice. It's embedded in everything they do. In any school, if you just instantly pull up their DEI policy, diversity, equity, and inclusion, although I say D-I-E, die, because uh, it's really killing these kids, unfortunately, you know, Anytime that happens. So, so the more homework I did, the more concerned I was, the more I pushed back. And very quickly, that superintendent put my entire family in harm's way. I've never felt more scared for my kids and my family than I did by basically breaking this thing and exposing it in my hometown. I had baseball bats at every door. I wore my sidearm all the time. We didn't allow my kids to walk across the street to the school. We were in the center of town, very exposed. We made them drive. That's how horrible it was for my family because the left doesn't play by the rules. And that's why I use ridicule, right? I've been attacked personally. Um, I had a guy in my hometown of Hamden say he threatened he was gonna rape my wife. I mean, it's just, it's nonstop, right? But I wouldn't say that that should necessarily scare you if you deal with it appropriately like I have, but that's the first thing they're gonna try to do. They're gonna try to push you back into the corner by calling you names and many people cave, right? To me, I just, I'm just like, well, that's not true because I have common sense and a brain. So what else you got? And then they just start like running away crying basically. I and mean, it's just, it's kind of funny. So, um, so ultimately what happened was I exposed this for a full year. Um, the superintendent then was not going to allow me to go to my girl's high school graduation. He was withholding me from my graduation from my daughters um, because I had been exposing them every day for like a year getting kicked out of school board meetings, social media, you know, going and, and basically trying to talk to as many people as I can. And half the town thought I was a hero and half the town thought I was a zero. And that's the same way it happens in every small town USA, okay? So that became a global story. The moment I stepped into Tucker Carlson's studio, he has a studio in Maine. 
uh, you know, that was the coolest experience. Uh, someday I'm going to write a book and that'll be a couple chapters. But he had never had somebody in his main studio. And uh, when I got the call, I said, hey, look, I know you're in Maine. Let's, let's just go. And uh, that kind of helped spur patriots across the country to then email and call the superintendent and say, look, if you don't hold this, if, if you don't let this guy go to his kid's graduation, there's going to be some problems. And those patriots basically flooded him. He went into a fetal position and he caved on everything. And the, the graduation went off without a hitch. So during that time, I was looking to move back to my hometown of Hamden, Maine. Um, I had worked hard 25 years in retail and a number of other things. And I quit my job as IT contract manager of a major health system in Southern Maine because I just wanted to decompress. It was a really tough emotional year. You may not be able to tell this, but I am an introvert by nature and doing this stuff emotionally drains me. Um, I can't do it without writing stuff down either. I have to be very prepared. But so I quit my job, moved back to Hamden. I just wanted to kind of just decompress and maybe work on the house a little bit. And some of my friends that I'd grown up with said, hey, look, you spoke for parents in Cumberland, Maine. Do you know how bad the Hamden school system is? And I just went, Jesus, really? Like, come on. <laughs> so uh, now we get into hypersexualization of minor students. So critical race theory is bad. Hypersexualization of minors is pure evil. Okay. And uh, again, these kids are being taught this at the age of five, starting in kindergarten. I've proven it over and over and over again. So Kelsey Stoyanova, the 2022 teacher of the year, just happened to be teaching in the middle school in my hometown of Hamden, Maine. And I saw the announcement and there was a thing in there about a book list. Hmm, a book list. So I, I, I asked for the book list. They wouldn't give it to me. I had the Freedom of Access Act FOA for the book list. I got the book list. Within two seconds, critical race theory, anti-father, anti-police, LGBTQ cultism, transgenderism, for 11 year old kids in middle school. And they celebrated Kelsey Stoyanova because of it. She was probably the wokest teacher they could have picked from and that's the situation. So uh, she was pushing a book called All Boys Aren't Blue to 11 year old kids through posters, prizes, daily announcements and incentives to read graphic pornography. It's disgusting. It is not a Harlequin romance. It is the grossest stuff you'll ever read in your life. And she was pushing it on 11 year olds. So that became another global story. But again, nine out of 10 people in my hometown have no idea what I'm talking about. So there were signs around this. This is, I want to read this to you. This is a testimony I received from one of her uh, students, an 11 year old in middle school in Hamden, Maine. Signs around my school telling me I don't have to use my assigned gender when I can make mine own up, pressuring kids that are 11 to label themselves. I've been harassed and verbally attacked this year by not putting a label on myself. I'm tired of having to defend myself constantly to others. Kids should not be pressured to figure out and label themselves and their sexual orientation until they have a chance to experience life and grow up. Again, this is an 11 year old giving this testimony. I'm scared all the time at what's going to happen next with a constant push of sexual orientation comments. I feel like I have depression and lots of anxiety because of what's happening in this school. Um, and I've got teacher testimony saying, you know, hey, grooming, that's what the sexual predators do to children, exposing them to sexual content in the classroom, language and visuals repeatedly to take advantage of them for their own perversions. That's the nasty stuff that's happening, at least in main schools, but I guarantee you it's happening in your local school as well. So I've exposed dozens and dozens of teachers, dozens of librarians. Uh, generally speaking, people don't like the way that I do it but I don't care because it's the only way I know how to do it. <laughs> I just have like cutesy time is over, right? You can't go about this politely anymore because the left doesn't care. They hate you. They hate you. They want you to feel as bad and miserable as they do and they'll do anything to get you there. So uh, kind of rapid fire here. Um, the American Library Association, which in my case, the main library association is an offshoot of, is run by a Marxist lesbian named Emily Drabinsky. She actually created, she put a tweet out when she was elected director, executive director of the ALA, uh, something about her being a Marxist lesbian, like it's her own words. And then she went to a socialism conference and stated that libraries should be the place for social interaction or socialist interaction. So you've got the books in the schools coming from a Marxist lesbian who believes in socialism. All right. It's no joke. 
Um, I've become in Maine the biggest advocate of saving women's sports, which is weird because I'm a dude. But um, I had Riley Gaines, the swimmer on my podcast, Marshy Smith from Icons recently. And uh, we talked about in Maine, the Maine Principals Association is allowing uh, this Saturday, tomorrow, the New England Conference Championship Cross Country Race. There is a runner named Soren Stark Chessa, who last year ran as a guy because he's a guy. And this year braided his hair, painted his nails, and they let him run as a girl. Now, he wouldn't have qualified for New England's. He was like a 30th place male runner, a mediocre kind of runner. Uh, but he was the third best uh, girl. And he won three back-to-back-to-back uh, uh, races before he got to the States. So you've got, you know, we've, we've extended into this situation where if, if I say, hey, that kid shouldn't be running with girls, well, you're just must, you just must be a transphobe, Sean. You must hate the kid. Well, you're, you're unkind. No, it's like it, the reality that we live in is he should be running with the dudes. That's I mean, it's like it's so simple, right? But people are afraid to speak out because they might get labeled, right? I'm, I'm far past that. Like label me all you want. I don't care. So in Maine, all female sports are done. Anybody that's ever laced up sneakers and run, anybody that's running now, any kid that wants to run later, they will be beat consistently by physically dominant males, weak males, mediocre males, but they'll be beat every single time. I've said a couple times, like I'm almost 53 and I'm out of shape. I guarantee you I could, I could beat one-on-one -on -one any female basketball player in Maine. I guarantee it because I'm more physically dominant than they are. And I still, you know, I haven't played basketball in years, but I guarantee you, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's like that science, right? That science, that's biology. It is what it is. So wrap it up, Sean. Um, I could go on for hours and hours and hours, okay? <laughs> so the easiest way to frame this is, is how much poison in the well would it take you as a parent to stop your child from drinking the water? Is it one drop? Is it a gallon? Is it multiple gallons? Like at what point do they get poisoned? To me, if I knew that well was poisoned even a teeny bit, and if I knew then what I know now, I would homeschool my kids in one or two hours a day or on the weekend, and even as dumb as I am, I would know I could do better than some of those folks that are teaching in the school. And I'm not anti-teacher. Um, I have family members that are teachers, really good friends that are teachers, and they tell me all the time how bad the school is, okay? So they are irreparably broken. Schools are irreparably broken. They're worth fighting for, but you gotta pull your kids out now, do it Monday. If any of you have kids or grandkids, I hope that one of you goes out and says, hey, I heard this guy talk, and." Scared the crap out of me? Let's, let's think about pulling our kid out, okay? So, um, but for many families, it hasn't gotten bad enough yet. The day that a parent calls me and says, hey, little Billy came home and wants to be called Karen, now what do I do? I say, well, it's gonna take you three or four years to deprogram your kid with intensive psychological work because Stockholm Syndrome, he trusted his teachers or his librarian so much that now he thinks, He's a, he's a girl, you know, it's just, it's horrible. Um, and you may remember in Loudoun County, Virginia, um, my friend, actually, he was up here snowmobiling last winter or in Maine. Uh, Scott Smith was labeled a domestic terrorist by Merrick Garland. He was the impetus of the FBI letter that went out in the fall, I think it was of 2022 maybe, um, because he sought answers for his 15 year old daughter who was raped in the bathroom by a trans girl, a guy wearing a skirt the school board covered it up, transferred the kid to another school. He raped another girl in that school, and then they covered that one up, okay? So it's just a matter of time that your local school system will have somebody raped in the bathroom or in the locker room, and when the innocence is lost, you can't stuff the toothpaste back in the tube. It's done, okay? So like I said, these people hate you, they hate your family, they hate the country, and because they want somebody else to feel as horrible as they do, they do what they do. So um, this was a quote, uh, socialism is precisely the religion that must overwhelm Christianity. In the new order, socialism will triumph by first capturing the culture via infiltration of schools, universities, churches, and the media by transforming the consciousness of society. Uh, that was Antonio Gramisky. Does anybody know the year that that was given? You were close, 1935, right? Almost 100 years ago, 
and we're still now in the same situation, although I, I would say maybe it's way worse now, because this generation, the dumbest generation we've ever seen, half of those people believe in socialism as the next way out. It's, it's absolutely crazy. So we're in a post-truth reality where it started with politically correct speech, then it got to everybody gets a trophy, and now boys can claim to be girls. So I would ask you to get involved, uh, start with your local school systems, go to a school board meeting, start to investigate some of these uh, books, because like I said, I've only uncovered probably 10% of the iceberg. Um, and just to wrap up, um, I've had some amazing guests on my podcast. Again, you can download anywhere you listen, and they're all K through 12 related. Um, I do most of my damage on Twitter, at Sean McBriarty, so if any of you guys are on Twitter, they call it X, but I have a hard time calling it X, um, at Sean McBriarty, and then I've got a, a fake book site called uh, Main Source of Truth. I'm surprised it's still up right now, um, but there are hundreds of examples that you can very quickly, easily delineate that'll happen in your same school system. So. Um, I want to say uh, thank you again to Brandon um, and uh, the Natural Law Institute for allowing me to come down and touch base with you guys. Um, I do this for free uh, because I choose to, but at the same time, I do have a give, send, go slash Sean McBriarty. If anybody knows somebody who knows somebody who knows Joe Rogan, it would be really cool to at some point be able to get sponsored so I can keep doing this because every two weeks my wife asks me, Sean, when are you going to get a real job again? Right? <laughs> And uh, to some degree, I say, well, I think I'm doing that job as a calling. I think I've been built for this. I think I have the skills to be able to stand up and take arrows for other people. But it does wear on you after a period of time. And uh, like I said, three and a half years, it's like 100 years in dog years or whatever. So, um, and, and I can't lie, I do make money on my podcast. I've made $83.99 on the 85 episodes that I've done. So technically, yes, thank you. Yes. Right. So uh, anyway, like I said, uh, my biggest thing in, in doing this is building relationships and having other people kind of connect across the country. If there's anybody that you know that needs help, uh, I'll give you my card. I'll be around all weekend and uh, I will take any questions. If anybody dares to ask any questions to America's Most Dangerous Dad, um, I would love to take some questions and be able to uh, then relate them back on the mic. So uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. What direction do you think it's going? Like, what's coming next? Yeah, so what direction is it going and what's coming next? So the next big thing is social-emotional learning. That's what's now infiltrating these schools. They are taking the COVID funding that is running out over the last couple of years, and they pumped in social workers and counselors. And at least in Maine, you can be 16 years old and get uh, chemical castration drugs, cross-sex hormones, they're permanent, by the way, at age 16 without parental permission. The counselors, it's a law, it's called chapter 117. You can keep secrets from parents uh, for kids that are confused. Like everybody goes through gender dysphoria, or not everybody, a, a small percentage, everybody goes through puberty. We're all like, you know, we've all gone through that. But as far as what's coming, what has happened is it was incrementalism over decades. Like they've ruined these schools in decades, right? In the last three years, they've dialed it up to 11. They are completely brazen. They'll put it on a poster like in the classroom now for the parent to see, hey, this is all of the cisgender, non-binary, you can pretend you're a cat, whatever you wanna do. So I just think it's gonna be more of the same. Um, and to me, the only way that I think we can win is to expose it to more people and make more people wake up. So um, what's coming next? A whole lot more really bad stuff uh, because they're just emboldened and embraced and, and they're just, you know, nobody's holding them back. You know, the floodgates are open, if that answers some of the questions. Yeah, go. What kind of support are you getting from the students? So yeah, so I've got a number of like little ninja students in local schools. They'll take pictures of stuff. Uh, many schools in Maine want to ban cell phones because they don't want this to be leaked out. That's how bad it is. For example, I had a student take a picture in, the, in my local school. The Spanish teacher has a big LGBTQ flag in her Spanish room, right? What does LGBTQ have to do with Spanish? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So uh, some of the students um, are trying to create uh, Turning Point USA uh, chapters inside those schools, trying to really you know, gain some of the conservatism back. But because the civil rights team, which is sponsored by the Maine Attorney General's office, is in every single school, and because every single school in Maine has the uh, Gay Sexuality Alliance, these kids, uh, very impressionable, they're afraid to get bullied by their peers. And I'll tell anybody, it's not the LGBTQ kids who are getting bullied, they are the bullies at this point. 
Um, so some students are stepping up, but it may be, I don't know, two out of a hundred, you know, so. Yes, hi. Um, I went to the Red Pill Expo in October of 2020. And there was a gentleman there, and I forget his name. He was probably in his mid 30s. Um, he's written a book. This education, the corruption of the education system, he's from a generation, is right up his alley. He said that Franklin Graham and Donald Trump said, just let it all implode. Yeah, so uh, let it all implode. I, I So uh, I got to interview Vivek Ramaswamy. I'm not going to you know, push any political deal, but Vivek and Trump to some degree, but Vivek actually has a plan. I'm a big Trumper, just to give you an idea. Um, they both want to eliminate the Federal Department of Education. $80 billion, with a B, billion, goes into the Federal Department of Education. It is a complete monstrosity. It's a waste. So let it implode from that perspective. I agree, but I guess as a father, I keep thinking, that what, I, what keeps me going is, I have a mom come up to my wife at church and say, we pulled our kid out today because of what your husband has been exposing, right? And to me, I'm like, well, that's worth it. And that also gains me like two more weeks until she asks me about getting a real job. But, um, so let it implode, I guess. Um, but I just, I don't think that that's uh, maybe the Christian way to do it, um, in my opinion, as a Christian conservative. Uh, I think we need to save every kid we can. And whether or not that's via life raft or whatever it is, I'm just trying to save them one kid at a time at this point, if that makes any sense. So. Well, you're actually speeding up the implosion process, really. Yeah, speeding up the implosion, I, I, I guess. I just, they're, they come out and double down every time I expose something. Every time. Like, if I expose something, they'll come out with a rainbow poster in the hallway. Like, boom. You know, and, and it's just they don't care because nobody holds them accountable. They have government jobs. They get basically every year, teachers get another 3 to 5% increase. There's no accountability to any of this stuff. And like I said, the product is the worst product we've ever seen. No business would ever survive this way. But we allow it to because it's for the kids, you know. So uh, any questions in the back there? Yes? Do you think, uh, is there a way that we can... Have y'all thought about a solution to help the children that are in the midst of this overcome some of the, the fear tactics that they've been preyed upon by? Yeah, and I'm, I'm doing some catch up. So for 40 years, I kept the church at bay. And about two years ago, a friend of mine said, hey, you want to come back to church? And I was like, no. And uh, I ended up going actually Halloween two years ago. And so for me, I'm trying to connect the dots between some of these biblical references. Um, but what I would say is if children could have a strong faith filled foundation, those kids seem to survive this because they know it's garbage. They know it's not true. If they have strong family values, uh, oftentimes if you, see, if you see a girl who has no father in her life, who has autism and you know, is maybe a little socially inept, those are the kids that are getting sucked into the trans cult very easily. So um, I don't know if that answers the question, but I think to me, you have to have these conversations. Like most of the time as a dad, and I did this myself, hey kids, how was school today? Oh, great dad, we did X, Y, Z. Okay, cool, let's eat, let's watch some TV, get to bed, boom, we're done. You really have to understand what's happening with your children. And like I said, the, the bond that you could have with a homeschool child is 100 times better than the bond that they're gonna have with that teacher, regardless if the teacher's a good teacher or not. It's just the whole system's broken. So. To me, save the kids by pulling them out immediately on Monday, developing a plan, and figuring out that homeschooling isn't as bad as those teacher unions want to tell you because they are the most educated, stupid people I've ever dealt with in my life. Um, so to me, that's how you save the kids. You get them out of the system. In, in reference to that, uh, is it, there is one thing I've noticed in our culture as far as kids are concerned, we tend to treat them like kids, and there's like this severe lack of providing them a purpose or responsibility. And uh, I feel like, as a result, a lot of these kids, especially with the millennial generation and the Zoomers, they have grown up still acting like kids and never reached that adult point. And so, my, like, is there, is there a way that we can change that particular culture? Because that might actually help yeah, and I mentioned it, um, for folks to get deprogrammed in their you know, late teens or early 20s is next to impossible. Like those are the, you know, running around trans cultists, just pushing global, you know, 
climate change and all this other garbage that isn't real. It, it's really hard to do that. Like, how do you how do you get them out of that? But I do see a lot of these uh, early twenties, late teens kids that are, they act like six year old petulant kids. They can't. They have a meltdown like they're in a grocery store when they're four years old, and you just go like, "Dude, what is wrong with you?" Nobody's ever said no. Nobody like to me. Uh, you know, this is kind of a like. Being called the most dangerous dad, like I'm not the most dangerous dad, like I can mess you up if you want me to, but the situation is, is like nobody, I guess, in their life ever told them no. They never heard the word or they never got put in time out or they never got the toy taken away from them or whatever it is. They've just gotten everything they want. And uh, again, I can't tell you I'm the best father. I mean, I think my wife did an amazing job with my kiddos, but uh, the situation is, is that, yeah, some of these kids, they are just socially inept um, and the schools tend to think, well, if we pump more money into the social emotional learning, we'll fix that. No, because kids can't do math. They can't do science. They can't read. And so, you know, what's the whole purpose of the school at this point? So anyway, anybody else? Yes, sir. Do you ever get the impression that any of the uh, people at the local level are motivated by the, the agenda or? Yeah, that's a good question. So an agenda, um, to some degree, some of this is all influenced by follow the money. If you follow the money every single time, it'll get you to the answer, guaranteed. Because nobody does this for free except for me. Uh, and I'd like to follow the money sometime, but I just haven't figured it out. So, um, but you know, if you look at the COVID shots, uh, and I'm a pure blood, by the way, I never got a COVID shot, so I'm told my sperm is worth like multiple millions of dollars. So just in case, but um, so, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? So uh, <laughs> I can think I can make some money at that. Um, but, but yeah, um, I'll give you an example. The superintendent of the middle school that the 2022 Teacher of the Year came from, her son, who's 25, thinks he's a woman, right? So you kind of go, oh, I can see why her school building is pushing constantly on this stuff. And they'll say to you, well, you know, Sean, these kids are going to kill themselves. It ain't because of me. They're already messed up mentally. It's a mental illness. It's a sexual narcissism. It's, it's the fact that, you know, again, nobody has told them, hey, look, the world doesn't revolve around you, Karen. You, you know, just, it's, it's such a mess, that it's a nightmare. But yeah, there's probably some of that. Um, I haven't really studied that a whole lot. I've kind of touched the edges of it. But every time that I see a group funded or funding the school department or funding the teachers union that has Bill Gates on it or Mark Zuckerberg or the Rockefellers or some of these folks, you just go, they're all making money off of just useful idiots at this point. Yes? Some of us live in Newburyport, right here. Yep. We just had an election. Two of our group, which is called CRE and Grant, we got about 900 votes. The lefties have won, three of them. It's all like Mo, Larry, and Curly. Same amount of votes. Yep. The whole town is so left. Well, here's here's what I would say. We tried. I almost got arrested handing out brochures last October. Two cop came, cops came and said, "You can't be here." Yes, I can. I'm on the sidewalk. So it's like, what the hell do you do? Now, I know what you're saying. So from an election integrity perspective, from a local elections perspective, you have to understand the left is so more uh, diligent in their approach. They are so, so much more organized because generally speaking, conservative parents are really busy running a business. They're a good employee. They're coaching soccer. They're a deacon at their church, whatever. They're organized, you know, but they're running around with their head cut off and none of the conservatives have time. These lefties, they, they work off of the government. Most of the time they're unemployed. They have all day to screw you guys up, right? So until it gets really bad enough, like really horrific shit bad enough, then maybe some more conservative parents will turn out. But that happened in my district as well. And uh, again, you just have to understand what you're up against. You're up against a machine at this point because again, people like myself took the, uh, I, I took my eye off the ball, you know, for 11 years out of 12 years of my kid's life. And then finally I was like, oh, this is really screwed up. And until it comes, until evil knocks on your door and busts it down, then you call me. To me, I, I take that hate fuel and it, and it empowers me to continue on. But for your situation, I can't speak to. But what I would say is when they freak out, you're hitting the target dead nuts. So keep making them freak out. 
And the more that they freak out, maybe other parents all of a sudden kind of understand the situation and they go, hey, I don't know that guy. I don't know what he said. I don't know how I like it, how he said it, but the truth is the truth, right? But it just hasn't gotten bad enough yet for enough people to really understand that we're losing our country. So God bless you. Keep pushing. That's all I can say. And uh, sometimes we've just got to keep uh, keep working through it. That's that's the only answer, I, I guess. So. And, and even when things are bad, there's no one shot solution. Good point. Yeah, you no. Have patience. This is probably an intergenerational problem. It's going to take a while. Yeah. So what I what I've said is, it's taken decades to screw the schools up. You're not going to fix it in three weeks, right? It's going to take decades to fix it. So to me, you pull the kid out of the situation, you solve for that issue immediately. Uh, and then you just start working on the other stuff, um, and you hope that reinforcements show up at some point. Yeah. Um, to add just a little bit to that situation, like the courtroom thing, if you you don't go out and just make blatant, like blindsided insults, but if you, tag, you target and get the truth, and it starts to unfold them emotionally, they're going to start to unravel. And the more you do that to them, they're going to eventually slip up and say exactly what they intend on doing. And eventually, you'll get them to where they, they can't think. And they're going to make a mistake. Yeah, they can't defend their position, uh, no doubt. And, and I, I appreciate it. Uh, Brandon, I think I'm like three minutes over. So uh, I, I, I do appreciate uh, the opportunity. Like I said, I'll be around. If anybody has anything they want to talk to me about, um, I'm more than transparent to a fault to some degree. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Sean. Oh, okay, one, one, one and a half more questions maybe? Hold on. Okay. Actually, just a point to make. My sister was in the Shelby County School District in Memphis for 30 years. And about two months ago, she said the next thing that's coming is social equity grading. Yeah, that's part of social emotional learning stuff too, yeah. The student determines the standard. Yeah. He takes a test and he says, well, these seven out of 20 questions I can't relate to because I grew up in the ghetto. Right. I didn't grow up in yours. You need to throw those no. out. Yeah, most of the most of the colleges, uh, the big colleges, Bates, Bowdoin, Colby, you know, in Maine, they allow people of color to have an extra 200 points on their SATs without really really earning it. Yeah. So, and it's the same situation, right? Same situation that's happening now in the classroom is that you know kids are like, hey, I, I don't understand that question. You know, Baltimore, none of the people in the schools can read. I think it was seven. So yeah, it's it's a it's a mess. <laughs> Like I said, pull them out now. So thanks, guys. All right, appreciate it. Thank you.